Hi everyone, Charlie Delto back with you for the next lecture in our series on epistemology. Now, we've already done uh, Wittgenstein when we did the logical positivist. Now, that was what gets called the early Wittgenstein, or the young Ludwig Wittgenstein. Many philosophers changed their minds over their careers. Aristotle did it. Aristotle had two books on ethics. It's the latter book on ethics, the Nicomachean Ethics, that most people take to be his real work. But he certainly had an earlier book. Uh, Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, famously had a very, very, very different latter work from his earlier work, before and after the Second World War, and Wittgenstein's never different. Now, in the Tractatus, Wittgenstein believed he had solved all philosophical problems, and true to his word, he left Cambridge and philosophy and went back to Austria, and he was, he was extremely rich, and he got all the money that was owed to him as, you know, one-sixth of the family fortune or whatever, and gave it to all his siblings and said, look, don't hold it in trust for me. Do what you want with it. I'm done with the family money. I'm going to go out and find a job. And he went out to be a primary school teacher. And he wandered into villages in, in Austria. He traveled there somehow and said, he, he took a, f a fake name and tried to cover up, you know, the fact that he was the most famous philosopher on the planet at that point in time and said, can I have a job as a, a primary school teacher? And initially he couldn't find any work as a teacher and he became a gardener. And you can imagine... This guy who was obscenely rich and just so clever and massively famous, like breaking leaves and putting them in piles and things like that, until he eventually found a job as a, as a primary school teacher. And look, the guy would have had a lot of post-traumatic stress. He was in the trenches in the First World War. We all know how that would have gone. But it didn't go very well for him. He uh, assaulted the children, basically. He pulled a girl's ears until they bled, and he hit a boy in the head, and that boy... Uh, years later, died of brain hemorrhaging, and it was always this sort of allegation that it might have been Wittgenstein. And he didn't... I'm going somewhere with all this, by the way. He didn't do very well with the common people. There's lots of correspondence from him, letter writing back to old friends that he had saying something like, damn it, these people are animals. Like, I, I can't talk to them. What's wrong with them? And he, he really didn't gel well with the common people at all. But he stuck at it for 10 years until he finally got to a place in his own mind where he thought, I think I might be wrong. And he reached out to his people at Cambridge and said, can I come back? And they said, of course, we want you to. And he wanted to be a, a tenured professor there, but he had this big problem. He'd actually never got a degree. He was the most famous philosopher in the world, but he didn't actually finish his course. He left before he, he could. The war started, you know. So they fast-tracked him through some Cambridge undergrad, and then he submitted the Tractatus as his thesis for a doctorate. And the story goes that it was G.E. Moore and Bertrand Russell that had to they do a review when you submit a thesis, and they question uh, Ludwig. What about this? What about that? And at the end of like two hour grilling or whatever, they said, well, congratulations, Dr. Wittgenstein. Welcome to Cambridge. And apparently Ludwig Wittgenstein stood up, slapped both men on the back and said, thank you very much. And don't worry, I know you don't understand the Tractatus and you never will. And walked out of the room. So arrogant. But anyway, he eventually wrote a second book, published posthumously, called Philosophical Investigations. The book is a series of dialogues between two people, kind of like, Plato's books. Uh, it's really hard to find. I can't find it anywhere in my city. I've had to mail order away for it. It's not on Kindle either. Uh, Wittgenstein rejects his early methods of using professional logical language to answer the philosophical questions that can be answered and proposes using ordinary language to do the same. One can't help but think that his turn living among the commons must have thought, well, these people are perfectly uneducated, but also perfectly well uh, able to make themselves understood. It might have even been the case that he, Ludwig Wittgenstein, with his exceptional language, walked into the local butchers or bakers or whatever and couldn't make himself understood as much as a, as a common person could. So I don't know that that's the case, but one can't help but let their mind wander in that direction, that this is perhaps what happened to him that led him to come back to Cambridge. He completely admits that his first book was wrong. And I quote, I have been forced to recognise grave mistakes in what I wrote in that first book. But the topics covered in books, the both books are the same, uh, logic, language, meaning, and the mind. The meaning of a term is not a set of rules or conditions. The great analogy, well, that's, that's the opening line. The meaning of a term is not set by any sorts of rules. And there's a great analogy which you should go with, with Wittgenstein if you're trying to use Latin Wittgenstein to explain your own versions of epistemology. And the great analogy is that of a game. Here's a game, ready? You roll the dice, you move forward the number that's on the dice. If you land on a snake, you go up. Sorry, if you land on the ladder, you go up. If you land on a snake, you go down. You know what I'm talking about, snakes and ladders, right? Here's another game. 
you have a hippo, it's hungry, you smash the lever and it eats the white balls, right? Hungry, hungry hippos. Uh, you have a checkerboard, white moves first, the queen can move as far as she wants in any directions. Chess, right? Now we can keep going like this and we have no, and you and I know that we'll never list all the games that there can be because anything is a game. And remember when you were a kid, like seriously, what was a game? Absolutely everything. A stick? Yes, that's a game. <laughs> a folded up piece of paper? Yep, throw it off the stairs and it flutters to the ground and that's a game, you know? Like a dark room full of cushions, pillows, rugs, and you better believe that's a game. I mean, that's a really good game for kids. So, I mean, kids, and even us as adults, like when we become, when we go out and we start dating, that's a whole new level of gaming each other. And when you get married, even still, when it's just you and your wife in a room, you've got things that you move and things that you try and things that you say and sometimes one party wins sometimes another party wins like games never end and whether even even if we're conscious of them we're playing them all the time a job interview is a game uh interacting with someone that you disagree with on twitter is a game so how do the rules of the game shall we say coalesce or come to be time fun repeated failures that's pretty much it and it's the same with language some games work and some games don't, right? Uh, language is the same. For those who have seen the movie Mean Girls, continuing running with that thing, Gretchen Wiener, the character Gretchen Wiener, tries to make the word fetch work, and it just doesn't work. And back in the real world, the lingerie football league, which was something that happened in America, never took off. Now, when I first heard about that, I thought, yeah, good-looking girls in their knickers, that's going to take off like wildfire. But it didn't. Why? I don't know. Like, half-nude women usually almost sells in every medium everywhere, but apparently not in sport. But then there's some things that took off, like Angry Birds. For those who haven't played the game, Angry Birds, and a bird flies and knocks some pigs down. Like, why was that so insanely popular? It's a funny thing. Fortnite, more recently, very, very popular games. Why? Uh, but language is the same, like uh, woke or trolling or you know, I'm no good at adulting or whatever the millennials say. These are all new words that come out. And every generation, my generation was no different. We had our words you describe that something was wicked or that something was mint or something like that why do these things work my oh, man your guess is as good as mine but it's just a game and Wittgenstein believed that language worked this way and is the fundamental means of representing ourselves in the world so when we want to make ourselves known we use language but to use language you have to play the game if language is meaning then grammar is logic and that isn't that different from the tractatus Misunderstandings come from the misuse of words or of bad grammar. So how does one learn to make their meaning better known then if I want to make fewer mistakes? Elocution lessons? Grammar lessons? No. You just play the game of language more. You just go out there and talk more and learn more about the, the way that people speak and things like that. I'm watching my two small children doing it right now. My son is using the word mate, like an Australian uses the word mate wrong. But slowly he's getting it right. Initially he seemed to think it was some sort of insult. We're on the road and uh, the, the cyclists were in the way of the car and we had to go slow until we could find a time to go around the cyclists. And he said, oh, stupid mates, why don't they get out of the way? And I didn't bother correcting him. He'll eventually work out that that's the wrong way of using that term. But anyway, he's learning and eventually he'll play the game long enough that he knows how the word mate is used. So where do we find all these language games? Well, they're embedded in actual historical networks of human activity and culture. Wittgenstein believes that language, sorry, believes that meaningful language is human action, that making yourself known is an action. Words are deeds, is his expression. We use them and they become deeds. So if we go back to the Tractatus for a moment here, uh, Wittgenstein in the Tractatus believed that all meaning is the meaning of these atomic propositions. However, Latter Wittgenstein wants to change this to say that the meaning of a word is its meaning in use. So that doesn't mean that the meaning of a word is what's written in the dictionary. That doesn't mean the meaning of the word is how Homer or Cicero or Descartes used it. The meaning of a word is how you used it in use. So I gave the example in the earlier lecture that Michael Jackson had a song out called Bad and then you could use the word bad to mean cool or good or something like that. And so legitimately, bad does mean cool. It's not an error. It's just a continuation of the language game. Here's a question for you all. Have you ever wondered this? I've wondered this since I was a child. 
how do we all know we're seeing the same colour, right? Like, I'm going to say this is a blue shirt. But what if your retina is different from mine and what you're really seeing is red, but your whole life you've been seeing blue as red. And when your parents said to you, hey, look, this is blue, you went, okay, okay, it is. But really you were seeing red. That question bothered me my whole life and it still bothers me now. And Wittgenstein has a certain sort of answer for this. I mean, we could be wrong about so many things, but if we take Wittgenstein's approach of playing the game, this should be mostly impossible. The meaning of words are not pictures in my head that I have to try and make clear. Rather, language is an utterance that has a use in public behavior. And the correct use of language is governed by this public criteria. So if I would go out in the street and point at a house and say, barn, and people correct me and say, no, 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 it's a house. And yet I can remember doing things like this, eventually working out that not everything was houses, they were apartments. And then I heard the American term, the condo. And then you would go to Europe and they'd have little things like huts or um, different sort of European names for not everything was a town. Something could be a village or could be a, uh, a hamlet even in England or something like that. And by the use of language, you would come closer and closer to understand the meaning of terms. Now, this thing, this sort of misuse of language, but it works, happens all the time. Think of some words like literally, actually, never, hate, love. I think that these terms get used wrong all the time, but it totally works. Like how many times have you heard people say, oh my God, I literally could not watch one more episode of Game of Thrones. Yeah, you could, you could, you could watch it. Oh my God, I actually never Worked hard in my entire life. Yeah, you must have at some point in time. Oh, I hate Trump. You probably don't. But we know they don't mean I have a loathing of hate for Trump. It's just like a cultural thing to say at the moment. Consider the word sorry. Sorry like, is derived from the word sorrow. So when I say, oh, I'm, your dog died, oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, I'm filled with sorrow. So you saying sorry when you hear something bad has happened is, is the correct use of language. Like, correct. But people will say something like, well, why are you sorry? You didn't do it. And they're confusing the word with sorrow with, sorry, with apology. But we do it all the time and everyone just seems to get away with it. And no one really bothers to stop and talk about the semantics of the word. We just keep talking and flowing and the game works and we make ourselves known. And to Wittgenstein, this is the only way we put meaning across. Directly from Wittgenstein, a cog that turns on its own but turns nothing else is not part of the machine. And this is where we're getting really close to Wittgenstein's famous statement, all language is public or there are no private languages. So with, with the machine thing, imagine there's a machine that one cog turns another and there's a belt which turns a pulley, which turns a machine, which makes the piston go up and down or whatever's happening. But somewhere in the machine there's just a cog whirring on its own attached to nothing. Wittgenstein saying that cog is not part of the machine. And Wittgenstein is also saying that someone sitting alone, not talking to anyone else, some shut-in in their own house who's invented their own words for everything isn't part of the machine. And their words have no meaning because it's not being, these words are not, this language is not deployed in use. And because the language isn't in use, it has no meaning. Now I just want to bring you to something that's going to come up in the next lecture. This is really dangerous. If you can stop someone from taking part in the conversation, you can render their words meaningless. And if you can render a whole political entity uh, silent, then you can make their cause meaningless. But we'll get to that later on. So keep in mind that we haven't really touched on anything epistemological yet. We're just talking about Wittgenstein. So let's go to his theory on epistemology, which is what this course is about. Let's return to that really good brain and of that argument and write it out formulaically. So let's take a, a skeptical proposition such as we are all brains and bats or perhaps I am a brain and a bat. And let's write that out. Where S is a subject, so me, I'm S, I'm the subject, and SP is a skeptical possibility such that I'm a brain and a bat. And Q is some sort of knowledge or claim about the world, a proposition such as I have hands. Let's write it out this way. If S doesn't know that not SP, then S does not know that Q. So if I don't know that I'm not a brain and a bat, then I don't really know that I have hands. S doesn't know that I'm not a brain and a bat. Therefore, S 
doesn't know that he has hands. And that's how you would write out the brain of that problem logically. Now, a guy called G.E. Moore, who we've touched on a few times, was a friend of Wittgenstein's and was at Cambridge when Wittgenstein was, had a, uh, shall we say, a rebuttal. And I'll have to get back on camera for this. Something like this. If, so this is the exact same first line. This hasn't changed at all. If S doesn't know that not SP, then S doesn't know the Q. Okay, let's start at the same place. What G.E. Moore is saying, he flips it. But S does know that he has hands. Therefore, S knows that he is not a brain in a bat. And it's a certain proof of against the brain in a bat argument. Now, people ask him, but G.E. Moore, how on earth did you know that you have hands? And this is how he proved that he has hands. Here is one. Here is another. I have hands. And it's, it's called the common sense proof. And a lot of people love it. And, uh, well, I mean, everyone pretty much loves it, don't they? It's, it's very reassuring to come back to something as simple as that, that we have very basic proof. Now, let's remember we're talking about Wittgenstein. Here is Wittgenstein's response, and it's, it's genius, and it really gets to what Latin Wittgenstein is talking about. Wittgenstein agrees that it is pure nonsense to say, oh, I'm not sure if there's a hand at the end of my arm here, while well, clearly looking at a hand at the end of my arm, right? No problem there. But he also thinks... It is nonsense to say, here is one hand, here is another, I know that I have hands, or something similar. Why? Because there's no plausible language game in which we might imagine someone saying, I know this is a hand. Yes, we understand the definitions of the words and the syntax is correct, but seriously, when would you ever really say, I know this is a hand, in real life? You're listening to me say it now, but I'm not really saying to you, I know this is a hand. I mean something like, hey guys, here's a really interesting philosophy thing over for you to learn. As an example, something about a hand. It is clear to say something, yeah, to go to another real world example here. Um, I suspect that I'm not getting paid enough because I'm a woman. And if it's true, I'm angry about this and I want something to be done about sexism. And I'm sure that's something that lots of women feel and are probably very right in feeling that way. But if we were to say something like, the genders are equal, or the gender the pay gap is a result of patriarchy, or hashtag believe all women, we've stumbled out of real life and we're now talking nonsense. These things, hashtag believe all women, there's no real language game that that exists in. So therefore, it's meaningless because it has no meaning in use. The, re the real meaning in use of hashtag believe all women is something like, I'm showing solidarity to Laurie Penny or Jermaine Greer or someone. I don't, I don't even think Jermaine would say that. Like, uh, the genders are equal. Its real meaning in use is something like a badge showing that you're a feminist. or some, It's almost like a platitude, you know. It has no real meaning. It's All of those statements are probably purely political and they don't make sense outside of the political world game it's all a way of saying i'm on one side of the tribe and and you're in a different tribe and we're enemies feminists say believe all women and their opponents say there is a war on men and all the rest of us lose interest and this is Wittgenstein. if you want to make yourself known you have to make a meaningful statement within the context of the word game that you are playing philosophy is just this People taking propositions that one would never really say in real life and pretending that people really say it and then trying to answer it even though it has become or is meaningless. To quote Wittgenstein again, the point of philosophy is to show the fly the way out of the bottle. When we have a philosophical problem, it is because we're stuck in something like a fly in the bottle, except we are the fly and the bottle is bad language. Bad language can be, yes, uh, poor grammar, or syntax, but it can also be language used out of its context. And in philosophy, we use bad language all the time. We take formally meaningful statements and then we try and philosophize about them and in doing so, render them meaningless outside of their word game. Philosophy creates problems where there aren't any. Philosophy does not solve problems. It does create them, however, by the process just described, and we must now dissolve the problems it's created. This was Wittgenstein's opinion. 
What can be said, and this is directly from Wittgenstein, what can be said can be said clearly. Whereof we cannot speak, we should remain silent. Now that's from Tractatus, but it also fits in philosophical investigations. And that's the genius of Wittgenstein. He had a young, important career in which he had a conclusion, and then he lived his full life, and then he had an older, much, much different philosophy, but he reached the same conclusion. And it's so tempting to fall in love with him at this moment because, wow, this guy really seems to know the answer. And he had the same answer over his whole life, even though he had this, he went to war and he was the most illustrious philosopher in the world. He had a hugely famous book and he was hugely rich. And he gave all his money away and he had other things going on in his life too. He was, almost all of his family suicided. He, when Hitler took over, annexed Austria, they couldn't, you know, they started rounding up the Jews immediately. And there, some of the families were so rich that Hitler's advisor, or Hitler himself, thought, well, we need to keep them out of the concentration camps because, quite frankly, they've got all the money. And Hitler only ever gave out 12, like, get out of jail free cards to people of Jewish descent to, so, they, so they weren't incarcerated or they weren't per per persecuted. Ludwig Wittgenstein was one of those people. Like, he was massively important. He, I think he... I don't know if this is true, but either he or his sister personally met Hitler to receive the get out of jail free card, so to speak. And yet, despite this tumultuous life, I think he was a homosexual as well. I mean, this was Alan Turing times. These are the times where you went to prison for that sort of thing, terribly. And he lived all the way through that horror as well, but still held this conviction that what can be said can be said clearly, where if we cannot speak, we should remain silent. It's very, very tempting to think this is the guy that knows the answer. Back to the epistemology, there is an underlying structure and logic in reality, and so there is in thought and therefore in language. We get the meaning of our thoughts and language from the utility in context. Clear meaning requires the conclusion of the context with thought or language. So logic is locally given, not universal. And to me, that means something like globalism can't work. It means to me something like perhaps in Silicon Valley or in Hollywood or in some, in, you know, like Seth Rogen's mansion with all the popular celebrities there, perhaps the genders really are equal there, but it's just possibly where someone else lives, they're not. And we're trying to make this one universal truth. We're trying to use language to say the genders are equal or all women are hypergamous or diversity is our strength. But those things might be true or might not be true given the language game that they're playing. And it must be tempting when you're, you know, like you're Emma Watson standing up in front of the UN looking resplendent in white and the whole world looking at you and all the world leaders already with their hands ready to applaud. They have no idea what you're going to say, but they're definitely going to clap you. When you say he for she or whatever it is she said, and then everyone applauds, within that word, word game, it may well be truth, but out in the real world, the rest of the world, you can't rip the words he for she out of that UN context and try and apply them to, you know, this events and under 15 B's cricket club and try and have it work or something like that. If you avoid trying to say the unsayable, there are no philosophical problems. There are some things that cannot be communicated. Communication is descriptive. We can describe states of affairs, right? Uh, we ought to something or other, like a moral claim, we ought not something. It's just nonsense. Like, it doesn't describe, okay, the microphone is black. That seems, it's an atomic fact, and we can describe it. And in the context of our word game, you might think I'm not actually describing a black microphone. I'm using an example. But if we weren't in a course, if I was speaking to someone, and someone said, what color is the microphone? I'd say, ah, the microphone is black. It's descriptive. There's meaning there. It seems to be true, verifiably true. So that's a good statement, but we ought not murder. It's kind of nonsense. Really what we're trying to say here is something like, I don't want you to murder, but we ought not. I'm not sure if there's any truth there. We can say something like, I feel hatred towards Nazi Germany or something like that. And I'm sure the Germans themselves feel that more so than the rest of us. A description, something like Nazi Germany is wrong and should never have existed. And it's just, it's just wrong. I mean, no one ever really says that. It's, it's not a very meaningful statement at all. It's just like an outpouring of blur. And it doesn't describe anything. It lacks meaning. As you'll see, or and are seeing, all of philosophy now concerns language. We're nearly at the end of Wittgenstein. But 
he we're not not you know, he, all of philosophy concerned language kind of started with Frege and the logical positivists, positivists, but they were going for that very, very, very special logical language, f of x, where x is wheels on a bike or whatever it was I said before. But now we're talking about ordinary language. There's this idea of diachronic language, so language over time. There's this idea of synchronic language as systems of relations, which we'll get to with structuralism. And Wittgenstein's approach is to say the use of language in practice, in the game, determines the meaning. From here on in, we enter the period of philosophy that you and I are living through today. And it's a very skeptical period of philosophy and we're still there now. I just want to give you an example of what I think is a, a very a very good example of why Wittgenstein's right. I happen to believe that Wittgenstein's on the money with this uh, language in use gives us meaning and uh, that we use language as games. I've used, I said before, dating, definitely dating. I always communicated differently with women when I was on a date than when I was working with them or when we were just friends or something like that. And I know my words change meaning. Something like, at work, you would be very accurate about your capacities or what you did or something like that. But on a date, you would like you would embellish and you would be expected to embellish. And you're active embellishing yourself, like overstating yourself. She would laugh and it would be funny. And she'd know that you were embellishing and she would be flattered by it or something like that. And you will never explain that to aliens. Or you'll never explain to someone that's never been on a date. But as you dated more and more, you realize your language changed more and more. And I'm sure... She, whoever she is, from her point of view, had her own way of speaking that wasn't how she would have spoken any other way. So that's where we're going to leave Wittgenstein. Uh, the next lecture is going to be a very short one where we just touch on structuralism. It'll be very short. It's post-structuralism, which is the big thing. But we'll just do a very quick uh, lecture on structuralism and then we're going to like revisit all that we've done and try and see where you and I are standing in the world right now before we get into neo-Marxism and post-structuralism and what comes after. Thanks, guys. Uh, see you in the next lecture.